Mr David Davis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Before I uh, enter into the subject we have here, it's, it was amusing to see the, the Minister rush to his place at the beginning of the uh, hearing. I, know, I see he's a, he's a friend, but uh, he's also standing in for a great friend of mine, James Brokenshire, who's a, an old friend, an old protege of mine, who, as we all know, is away ill. And I just would take my opportunity now, through you, to wish him the best of luck in his treatment yeah, yeah, and his yeah, rapid, yeah. rapid return to, to the chamber. And as you say, I have consulted with the clerk, so what I have to say uh, is I'm going to skirt very carefully around the, the sub to say rules. Now, since we agreed the UK-US extradition treaty in 2003, it's been abundantly clear that the British government of the day struck a truly dreadful deal. Asymmetric, ineffective and fundamentally unfair on British citizens. It's a terrible flaw in our own justice system. The previous Labour administration approached the treaty as though its duty was first and foremost to support the wishes of our American friends, not to safeguard the rights of UK citizens. Perhaps in the context of the terrorism sweeping the world at that time, uh, this was understandable. But friends must be honest with each other. And now we must say enough is enough. The 2003 treaty paved the way for British citizens to be handed over to the US authorities with minimal safeguards against injustice. Numerous examples down the years have shown this, from the NatWest 3 to Christopher Tappin. The recent decision to block the extradition of Mr Assange did not add to the list. Uh, however, the judgment earlier this month was a human rather than a legal victory. Now, while we, of course, cannot discuss the substance of the Assange judgment here today, the House must note a worrying development more generally in our extradition arrangements extradition for political offences. This stems from an erroneous interpretation of Parliament's intention in 2003. This must now be clarified. Article 4 of the UK-US Extradition Treaty provides that extradition shall not be granted for political offences in, uh, in the UK. The treaty was implemented in the 2003 Extradition Act. It has been claimed that because the Act does not specifically refer to political offences, that Parliament explicitly took the decision to remove the bar when passing the Act in 2003. That is not the case, Madam Deputy Speaker. Parliament had no such intention. Had they intended such a massive deviation from our centuries-long tradition of providing asylum, it would have been explicit. When the extradition bill was debated in the Commons, members raised concern around extraditions in relation to political offences. The minister, um, I think Belainsworth, I think it was, the minister anyway, responding to those uh, concerns, gave a clear and unequivocal answer. The bill will ensure no one can be extradited where the request is politically motivated. The government today has also recognised this. In October 2019, the Home Office confirmed that such a bar was implicit in UK law and that it would be down to judges on a case-by-case -case basis to decide whether to apply the bar. But recent cases before the courts have shown that, in, that an implicit bar is not enough. We must have clarity on this issue. It's vitally important that our extradition arrangements have appropriate protection for political offences, not least because political asylum seekers may seek the protection of British justice in the future. But that's not all. When the 2003 extradition treaty was introduced, it was sold on the basis, uh, and I remember because I was a Shadow Home Secretary, it was sold on the basis that would be used principally for paedophiles, murderers and terrorists. But the people we are extraditing to the US today are mostly white-collar businessmen who pose no physical danger to the United Kingdom or US citizens. Between 2007 and 2019, the UK surrendered 135 individuals to the US, 99 of which were for non-violent offences. Instead of seeking justice against dangerous criminals, the United States is seeking to be judge jury and executioner for global commercial deals. In 2012, the Home Affairs Select Committee said that the US, and I quote, has the power to reach out around the world and, provided there is a very, very tenuous connection with the US, it generally has the power to prosecute, end quote. This has been shown in case after case. Cases such as Ian Norris, the former head of Morgan Crucible, or the NatWest 3, or Christopher Tapping, and numerous others. These cases all have common themes. They are all British citizens. The alleged crimes all took place on British soil. The UK authorities did not see them as having a case to answer. 
but the UK system failed to protect them and the US authorities ultimately got their way. Now, of course, people must be brought to justice when they break the law. But the problem at the heart of this extradition process is that it is fundamentally asymmetric and unbalanced in favour of the United States. This lopsided treaty allows US citizens to evade justice while exposing UK citizens to miscarriages of justice. In a 2011 report on our extradition arrangements, Lord Justice Scott Baker concluded we did not need to change the rules to ensure London-based offences are dealt with here in the UK. He was wrong. He failed to give enough weight to the US ambition to extend its extraterritorial jurisdiction of commercial crimes. He also made no allowance for the incredibly one-sided nature of prosecution and trial of foreign suspects in the US justice system. An American citizen facing extradition to the UK can challenge it in a US court on the basis there is no probable cause. But a UK citizen facing extradition has no right to a reasonable grounds hearing. That's what the Joint Committee on Human Rights called in 2011 a lack of reciprocity in the treaty when it called for reform of that treaty. In the case of political offences, the treaty allows the US executive to determine what is and is not a political offence. In the UK, we rightly leave this to the courts. What's more, the US Secretary of State has far greater discretion to refuse an extradition to, uh, than our Home Secretary. The British Extradition Act says the Secretary of State must issue a certificate for extradition. The equivalent US code states the Secretary of State may order the person to be tried. Such a seemingly minor change in language has a dramatic effect. With the US being a larger country and with the UK being closer to the front line on terrorism, you would expect the numbers being extradited from the United States to the UK to be greater than those going in the opposite direction. The reverse applies. The US has only surrendered 58 individuals to the United Kingdom since 2007, only 11 of them American citizens, while 135 have gone the other way. And there is no starker example of the inequity and imbalance in the case that you mentioned, Madam Speaker, Deputy Speaker, of Anne Sekoulis and death of Harry Dunn. In this case, the US Secretary of State used the discretion afforded only to the US under the treaty to prevent the extradition. The Prime Minister himself has recognised this imbalance. On the 12th of February last year, he said, I do think that elements of that relationship are unbalanced and it's certainly worth looking at. Yet nearly a year on and we remain in the same position. The courts may be starting to recognise the imbalance. In the wake of the decision to block Gary McKinnon's extradition, UK courts were given the power to bar extradition on forum grounds so that crimes committed primarily in the UK against UK citizens could be tried in this country. The absence of the forum bar in the 2003 Act highlighted just how cavalier the Blair administration was with the rights of British citizens. The safeguard had existed previously in the 1957 Conventional Extradition and citizens almost universally elsewhere in Europe uh, could count on its protection. Now since 2018, in the cases of Laurie Love, Stuart Scott, Robert McDade and Christopher Taylor, the courts have used this bar in a partial attempt to even up our extradition arrangements. This asymmetry is not an inevitable outcome of being an ally of the US. It's a policy choice. Countries like France and Germany both refuse to allow their citizens to be extradited and for good reason. David Birmingham, one of the NatWest Three, described to the House of Lords how he and his co-defendants were extradited to Texas and put in hand chains, foot chains, restraining belts and everything else and then strip searched. And this is designed not only to intimidate the accused but also to score a PR victory for American prosecutors. Those extradited to the US face this treatment whenever they're dragged into and out of court in front of the television cameras and the paparazzi. And all this comes at the expense of the presumption of innocence. It's often the case that once extradited to America, the accusers refuse bail. This is on the basis they're a flight risk. The result is they're thrown in a cell, often shared with a fellow inmate, possibly a hardened criminal, and their access to legal papers is massively restricted. Their ability to contribute meaningfully to their defence is totally handicapped. This is particularly damaging in all those white-collar cases where the relevant evidence can stretch to millions of pages and the prosecution faces no requirement to tell defendants which pieces of evidence they intend to rely on. 
They then face enormous pressure from the US authorities to agree a plea bargain. They're told if they refuse a deal, they'll be denied bail and face decades in a maximum security prison. But if they plead guilty, they'll receive a much lighter sentence in an open prison. They're also reminded of the huge financial cost in America of protracted and complex trials, often running into the millions or tens of millions. It takes a brave person to turn down the easy route. David Birmingham's described how he had to negotiate his punishment before he'd even settled on the crime he would be pleading guilty to. And this is repeated across the US legal system, where a massive majority of cases are settled by a plea bargain. I think the number is 97%. Take the case of Jamie Olis, an employee at a US energy firm who stood accused of fraud. He refused a plea bargain and protested his innocence in court. He was handed a 24-year sentence. His boss at the firm, presumably more responsible, took the plea bargain route and cooperated with the government. He was sentenced to just 15 months. 15 months for the boss, 24 years for the subordinate. Plea bargains are just one of the tools used by US prosecutors to stack the deck against defendants. They also deliberately use the threat of prosecution to disable the defense's witnesses. Witnesses willing to cooperate with the prosecution are given immunity, whilst witnesses, whilst witnesses who refuse to do so find themselves threatened with prosecution themselves. For cases where the alleged crime is in Britain, no British defence witness is going to travel to a court in the US, risk being charged on arrival and never coming back. What is more, prosecutors label these witnesses as co-conspirators, which handicaps the, the defence's ability, but maximises the prosecution's ability to use their evidence. These tactics are such a serious issue that in one American case, a Mohammed Dollar, the judge described it as a fundamental unfairness that might well amount to a denial of due process. And it's not just the prosecution inside the courtroom stacking the deck against the defendant. The First Amendment to the American Constitution allows the American media to print and broadcast sometimes frenzied coverage of trials, which inevitably prejudice their outcome. In effect, high-profile defendants in the US face trial by the media as well as trial by jury. Now, this has been laid bare in a string of cases, I mean, most famously O.J. Simpson, but, but perhaps most perniciously, the case, not so well known here, but well known in the States, of the Central Park Five, which led to a miscarriage of justice for 13 years, one person in jail for 13 years, and she was eventually exonerated. Compare this to the UK. The Contempt of Court Act, as you reminded me at the beginning, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Contempt of Court Act safeguards the presumption of innocence by stopping anything being published that prejudices ongoing trials. Indeed, it's these protections that prevent me today from discussing cases relevant to this debate, which are sub judice. My speech today is entirely properly, sharply constrained to avoid mention of half a dozen extant cases, actually, in the interest of not biasing justice. The US justice system, as applied to foreign suspects, is not normal justice as we understand it here in the United Kingdom. So my argument to the Minister, and I'm not expecting a great reply today, but my argument to the Minister is that we must rethink the entire relationship with the United States on extradition. We must navigate a constructive path forward for both countries based on arrangements that are balanced, fair and reciprocal. We should remember we are friends, not enemies, allies, not rivals. This is particularly important as we seek to embark on a new trading relationship. In the next decade, our two countries will develop even closer commercial relationships. Businesses developed by brilliant British inventors and scientists will look to merge and cooperate and sell to big American companies in the bigger American market. If the current extradition treaty stands, every one of them could face American extraterritorial legal actions and a legal system stacked against them. In the interests of both countries, this must change. The Extradition Act not only touches the lives of renowned political actors and international business executives, but it also impacts families such as Harry Dunn's. If the American government insists on trying to exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction in its interest, perhaps we should mimic Israel and refuse to extradite British citizens for anything other than serious crimes of violence and terrorism. We must give our citizens the protection, certainty and justice that they deserve and that our judicial system has a proud history of upholding.
Thank you, Madam. Yeah, yeah. Minister, Mr Crisville. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As my right hon. Friend, the Member for Halton, Prowse and Howden said, I'm here deputising uh, for my right hon. Friend, the Member for Old Bexley and Sidcup, who is currently uh, awaiting some treatment. And I'm sure the whole House will want to send him their very warmest wishes for a very, very speedy recovery uh, to his duties at the Home Office, his duties in the House and his duties at this dispatch box, where he will unquestionably do a far better job than I do. So uh, I wish him... Uh, a rapid recovery and a rapid return. Uh, I congratulate my right hon. Friend, the Member for Halton Price and Howden for securing this debate on extradition. Uh, I think it's a topic he's consistently raised in this House over a period of time and has uh, been part of his long-standing record as a champion of civil liberties in a, in a whole range of areas. And it's uh, a great privilege to, to be here this evening responding to his speech. I would start by saying extradition arrangements are a vital part of the government's toolkit in combating crime. It clearly serves the interests of justice to be able to uh, bring back to the United Kingdom people who have committed offences here, where we want to prosecute them, and similarly, where people in the UK have committed offences elsewhere. It is reasonable for them to face justice uh, in the countries that legitimately want them. So I think the principles of reciprocal extradition treaties are an important part of our justice system. And in recent years, in relation to our extradition arrangements with the US, uh, we have successfully managed to bring back into the UK, under that agreement, people who have committed very serious offences, to stand trial here for those offences, including rape, murder, manslaughter, and many child sexual offences. And clearly it serves the interests of justice and public safety that those people are subject to prosecution. Uh, it's worth mentioning, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Extradition Act 2003, uh, the subject of this evening's debate, uh, is organised geographically in two parts. Part one provides arrangements for European uh, Union countries and part two of the Act applies to all other countries where we have uh, formal arrangements through the European Convention on Extradition, the Commonwealth Scheme, or a bilateral treaty. Requests from any other country where we do not have formal extradition relations are dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. And as the, my right friend has said, where the UK considers a request by another country to extradite one of our citizens, um, the uh, standard looked at is a reasonable suspicion. That's the threshold applied in deciding whether or not an extradition request is reasonable. In terms of numbers, um, it's worth just pausing on this for a moment. So in terms of uh, the part one extradition figures for the, uh, the last um, financial year, 2019-2020, uh, where the requests were made by European Union countries. Uh, European Union countries requested uh, 1,168 individuals who were physically present in the UK, of whom 689 were sub subsequently sent out to one of those European Union countries. Uh, similarly, we wanted to get hold of 269 individuals who were somewhere in the European Union, of whom 231 were brought into the UK. The reason I mention those figures is by way of comparison um, to the US figures that my right honourable friend mentioned um, in his speech. Uh, first of all, those numbers in relation to EU countries in both directions are far higher. Those numbers I mentioned were for just a one-year period, far, far higher by a multiple than the US figures. And also the ratio. Uh, in relation to EU countries, far more people, about three times more people, were taken from the UK into European countries than the other way round. And that ratio is very similar to the ratio in relation to the US. So that ratio is, is broadly similar, whether it's the US or the European Union. So I wouldn't take that disparity in itself uh, to indicate that there is a uh, fundamental um, problem, uh, unless we're going to argue there is a similar problem in relation to the European Union, um, which I don't think anyone uh, has so far suggested. I'd like to just... Um, try and address some of the most fundamental uh, points the right honourable member made in his speech. He essentially, his central allegation was that there is an imbalance, an asymmetry in the arrangements whereby um, it is easier and it is faster for the uh, United States to extradite UK citizens or people in the UK rather than vice versa. And 
I'd like to sort of take each of the uh, points in turn um, which, which might be cited in support of the suggestion that there is an imbalance. And one of the first points that often comes up uh, is, the, um, is the evidential threshold. Uh, so what, what standard, what threshold do you have to reach in order for an extradition request to be granted? Uh, now, in the United Kingdom, as we've discussed already, uh, broadly speaking, the test is of reasonable suspicion. Now, uh, for a request in the other direction, where the UK is requesting extradition of somebody uh, in the US, um, then the standard is what essentially amounts to probable cause. Now, the question is, do those, do those stand, are those standards equivalent? Is reasonable suspicion equivalent or not to probable cause? And this is a question that was considered in 2011 by uh, Sir Scott Baker, uh, a very senior, I think, retired judge. And he concluded, having examined the matter, that both tests are based on reasonableness, uh, that both tests have to be supported by equivalent documentation, and that both tests uh, represent the standard of proof applied by police officers in, most, uh, in both jurisdictions, and that in substance, uh, the, the threshold represented by those two tests is broadly the same. And this was something the Lord, House of Lords, the other place, looked at in 2014, where their select committee um, took evidence. And the select committee in the other place, uh, the extradition select committee, concluded uh, that although the tests are in some elements different, they said, and I quote, whether this difference has any practical effect is debatable. Um, so and they go on to say, um, the, uh, the, sort of exper the actual experience to date demonstrates, and I quote again, that they are functionally, the, the, the argument that they are functionally the same is persuasive. So uh, we've heard uh, Sir Scott Baker and the House of Lords Committee um, g give an opinion that essentially the thresholds applied in the two uh, jurisdictions are, are broadly speaking equivalent. Um, the second area where one might seek uh, a difference, a divergence between the arrangements is a point that the right honourable member touched on, which is around discretion. He pointed out quite correctly that the US uh, Secretary of State uh, has a discretion to refuse uh, an extradition request, whereas the Secretary of State here is under an obligation to grant one after the matter has been considered, if requested, by a court. And now, we've seen a number of cases where the courts in the United Kingdom, including very recent cases, one of which Madam Deputy Speaker referred to, um, where the courts in the United Kingdom have refused an extradition request. So the protect, there is protection provided by the courts. And moreover, there is a right of appeal. So if, a, if the court in the first instance uh, grants an extradition request, then there is an appeal. And in fact, I think there are probably two, uh, two levels of appeal above the court of first instance. So there is substantial uh, judicial intervention to protect the rights of UK citizens in the way uh, that I have just described. Uh, but it's instructive, I think, to think about the numbers. So how often do our courts uh, protect uh, people in the UK subject to extradition versus how often does the um, US Secretary of State exercise their unfettered discretion? And the answer there is actually very starkly in favour of the United Kingdom. Since the treaty was entered into, um, I'm told that on, on 21 separate occasions a few of which the right gentleman referred to, on 21 separate occasions, and I'm not sure if that includes or excludes the recent Assange case, um, the UK court has said extradition may not occur. The courts have stopped extradition 21 times. Conversely, there has only been one occasion in which the US Secretary of State has exercised their discretion and declined one of our requests, and that is the case of Anne Sekoulas, which we shouldn't debate too much, uh, but that is the only occasion on which that discretion has been exercised. So I think that gives some sense that it's perhaps not as, as one-sided as, as um, is occasionally suggested. There's a third argument, um, which again, the right honourable gentleman um, advanced with his characteristic uh, eloquence and passion and attention to detail. And that is this question about whether crimes might be committed in the UK which have only a very tangential connection to the US and the US authorities reach into the UK and pluck out suspects who really have, have very little to do, if anything, with the United States. That is the substance of the suggestion. And my right honourable friend referenced a select committee report in 2012, which drew attention um, to these, excuse me, Madam Speaker, uh, drew attention to these problems. Uh, I think partly in response um, to that select committee report, and in response to some of the cases um, 
in the first decade of this century, which the Honourable Gentleman referred to, um, the 2003 Act was amended um, on the 40, in October of 2013, so 10 years after the Act first came into force, and a new section, 83A, was introduced into the 2003 Act, which gave the United Kingdom courts the ability to refuse extradition where either a, a substantial measure of the requested person's relevant activity was performed in the UK, so their offences are mostly UK offences, or where extradition would be contrary to the interests of justice. And at the time, um, the US Embassy um, weren't terribly happy about those uh, changes. So I think that those, those amendment, that amendment, the new Section 83A, introduced in 2013, goes a long way to making sure that people whose offences are only very loosely connected to the US and the substance of which were allegedly committed in the UK uh, are afforded uh, quite a good measure of protection from extradition uh, to the United States. That was a very important change that I think goes uh, quite a long way towards protecting UK citizens. And the courts have, have used that power. Um, they've also used human rights law, as the Honourable Gentleman has mentioned, in cases like the Gary McKinnon case and the Laurie Love case, where, uh, and indeed more recently as well as Madam Deputy Speaker said, where uh, the, um, the, the defendant or the prospective defendant has successfully argued before our court that their human rights would be infringed in some way if the extradition proceeded. And our courts here in the United Kingdom have afforded that protection. So I think that is a, a very significant uh, point in the debate that we're currently having. I'd be delighted, of course. I'm very grateful to the Minister. How does he respond to the point made by my right honourable friend that an innocent person finding themselves on trial in the United States, our closest ally, as we all agree, would nevertheless be put under intolerable pressure to plead guilty because if he gambles on proving his innocence and fails, he faces a, an enormous sentence, whereas if he confesses to a crime that he did not commit, he can get off with a few months in jail. Well, I mean, the argument being advanced by my honourable friend essentially uh, is saying that the US justice system is inherently um, not fit for purpose. Of course, the rules he's describing apply as much to US citizens as they do to anyone else. Um, and although the practice in the United States of plea bargaining um, is not a practice we have in this jurisdiction, I don't think I would agree with the general proposition that the US justice system is an inherently unjust system and it's so bad we cannot allow anyone to be taken from this jurisdiction into the US jurisdiction because the system there is just so terrible um, that, they, that justice will not be done. I don't accept that characterisation. Uh, of course, there are points of difference, as have been pointed out, but I don't think those points of difference are such that we should simply turn around and say we will have nothing to do with the United States at all. I don't think that's not a conclusion um, that, that, I would, that I would share or would concur with, uh, and therefore I don't think is a basis upon which uh, we would want to essentially discontinue all extradition um, relations. Yes. I had not intended to, to uh, um, interfere in the Minister's uh, course, but since he, he, this point, point has been raised, the most fundamental thing underpinning all extradition arrangements, whether it's to America, Europe or whatever, is a presumption that the justice systems are reasonably equivalent. And this is where the weakness comes in here. And I take the case of Mike Tappin, who was uh, uh, extradited. He was something, somewhere in his 60s, 60, 65 maybe. He was threatened with a 30-year sentence if he didn't uh, basically confessed to a crime he didn't believe he committed. Uh, that is an intolerable difference, and it's not just criticised here. He, he says quite rightly the, the Americans face the same thing. It's a subject of massive criticism in the United States, but they're stuck with it until they change it. And it, it seems to me that when we think about these treaties, not just for America but for other, treat, uh, other areas, that we should actually consider trying to guarantee equivalence of justice in delivery as well as in principle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, thank the Honourable Right Honourable Gentleman for his intervention. Look, I think the, uh, the test isn't that the justice systems are identical, it's that they are just. And I don't think I would accept the argument the American system is fundamentally unjust. However, if there are particular circumstances of a case, uh, and perhaps the case the Honourable Gentleman uh, mentions would have met that test, 
had he advanced, had he advanced this defence. You know, if there are particular circumstances where a grave injustice is threatened, then the UK courts, on human rights grounds, and, the, and human rights grounds include the right to a fair trial, can be invoked, and a UK judge or an English judge can be invited to prevent extradition. And it was on grounds, I think, as I understand it, very similar to those, that the recent case uh, involved the judge making precisely that finding. So if a miscarriage of justice is threatened, application can be made to an English judge to prevent the extradition, using arguments not unlike those the Honourable Gentleman himself has just advanced. Um, I fear we are approaching the witching hour, and I should therefore draw my remarks to a conclusion. The Government will, of course, keep this area under um, careful and vigilant review, uh, prompted, as ever, by the Right Honourable Member, to whom I am extremely grateful for raising this important matter here this evening.